And we're joined here by David Whitmer from MGP. It's our master blend gym. Bring us to their cool whole new lineup. Unfortunately, Will and Sarah aren't here today. Uh, they had their little ones sick, so it's just me. So yeah, so just put up with us. So we're gonna have a great time talk to all this cool uh, Remus and Rossville and Aiton Sand and Till. So I'm gonna turn it over to David and let him talk about all those cool products. All right, well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me today. Uh, we're going to focus today on our Remus Repeal Reserve Series 2 and Series 3. But before we do that, I want to remind everyone of MGP's brands. I think some of you know that uh, MGP we make for a lot of other people. And a few years ago, we came out with our own brands. Uh, the first brand that we came out with was our Till American Wheat Vodka. This is made our, at our distillery in Atchison, Kansas. That distillery has been there since 1941. And before there was a distillery there, uh, there was a plow company. And mm. that's why we named this brand oh. Till, to honor that's that cool. plow company that sat there. And as people went out to settle the prairie, they picked up their plow. And Makes sense. Yes. And uh, being in Kansas, and there's a lot of wheat grown, uh, mm. this is made from Kansas wheat. Uh, we make a lot of corn vodka for other people. We wanted our vodka okay. to be a little different. Awesome. So this is uh, American wheat vodka till all right i do like wheat vodka in general so and it it's is my preference it is very you know when you you try people on a vodka mm -hmm. they're a little sheepish because right. they rarely had vodka straight True. but um they'll, they'll i kind of forced them to do it <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and they're they're surprised because you know it doesn't burn right. it's really creamy uh has just a little hint of vanilla and mint mm -hmm. that they didn't expect and so it's it's very yeah, good it's good it's not rubbing alcohol exactly we, didn't, we had that dinner the other, i was shocked with a vast difference that was oh yeah because i forced you to drink a beer. yeah we did Straight, yeah <laughs> so it worked out good so so with no first experience i know for sure that we all tasted it so i know what it tastes like so it, it was good all right uh another brand that we have is our eight and sand blended bourbon whiskey and a lot of folks get a little concerned and confused when they when they see that term blended and then they rarely see it in conjunction with the word bourbon because generally True. it's just a blended whiskey mm -hmm. a blended whiskey is whenever you take multiple multiple types of whiskey and put them together mm -hmm. whether it's bourbon rye whiskey light whiskey any oh, of those yeah. things just all those fun things uh, many times though a blended whiskey will contain grain neutral spirits right. which is vodka and some type of artificial coloring so that it looks brown. Right. <laughs> Our eight and sand contains neither one of those. So it's majority bourbon, and that's why you're able to call it a blended bourbon whiskey. Okay. Makes sense. But it also contains some of our rye whiskey, corn whiskey, and light whiskey. Oh, and a lot of people have questions about light whiskey because sometimes I say that and they yeah, think explain it's, what like, that is. it's like some what type that is. of, you know, diet whiskey. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a diet whiskey. What uh, the TTB allows you to do mm -hmm. is there are two types of whiskey, corn whiskey and light whiskey that you can put in a used barrel. Okay. So all bourbon, all rye whiskey, malt whiskey, uh, those all have to be in a new charred oak barrel. Okay. except light whiskey and corn whiskey. Okay. And you're allowed to use a used barrel for that. Awesome. And most people use corn whiskey and light whiskey as some kind of a blender okay. or in something sense. they're going to flavor. Sure. Okay. So we have light whiskey that maybe has aged eight, nine, 10 years. And that long wow. in a used nice. barrel is still very flavorful. And so awesome. we kind of wanted to showcase everything we do yeah, it's in one cool. bottle yeah. and uh, but still wanted to be a little different mm -hmm. and highlight the fact that it's majority bourbon yeah and it's mm -hmm. delicious that's for I, i'm that's probably some of my favorite things i ever had because <laughs> i bought it was like the price was like under 30 mm -hmm. and it's just 29.99 here in texas and it especially opened up it's good but man we let it like sit for a couple of weeks and oxidize it. holy crap it's amazing mm -hmm. that's just the nose in this thing's incredible yeah, it, it is you very really can't beat it with the price. People will tell me, oh, don't buy that. It must be terrible. <laughs> You're like, save it for me. You don't want that. It's like, oh, I see. It's really good. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Some guys like, You're right. It's really good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been just thrilled how good that is. Well, thank you. Uh, a little bit about the name, Eight and Sand. So, in railroad speak, Eight and Sand was a term or an expression for smooth sailing or mm -hmm. good luck. Okay. So on the locomotive, the throttle, the highest position was an eight. 
Okay. And of course, they use sand sometimes between the wheels and the rails to get traction. Okay, that makes sense. And somewhere along the line, somebody put that together as an expression. <laughs> it had kind of uh, gone away, and most people yeah. didn't know that, and we resurrected it. Uh, this particular locomotive that's on the label, the 811, is was part of the Atchison Topeka Santa Fe. Oh, cool. And this particular locomotive just sets a few blocks uh, from our distillery in Atchison, Kansas, awesome. as part of our uh, local depot and train and exam or whatever. Very yes, cool. Yes. And so because of that, um, the markets that we are in mm -hmm. with this product, we are donating some of the proceeds to uh, rail preservation or rail oh, awesome. history. Very cool. You know, everybody loves trains. I, I do love trains. We're in the 100th 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad. And yeah. so we're doing some events with that. Very cool. And, you know, who doesn't like a train? Absolutely. So, <laughs> so trains are always fun. <laughs> That's right. I don't know anyone that doesn't say they don't like trains. Yeah. And our responsibility statement for this brand is keep it on the rails. So. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's a, well, good, that's a good statement. Yeah, yeah. So I usually need to end most tastings with that. So. Yeah, yeah. You're not kidding, right? That's, that's a valid point for sure. All right. We will get to our George Remus bourbon in just a moment, what we're going to taste. But I do want to talk about our Rossville Union rye whiskeys. Um, at MGP, we are known for rye. Mm -hmm. uh, we do make oh, a yeah. lot of rye. <laughs> and um, our brand that we came out, this is the the most current brand that we have because we okay. first came out with Till, then we came out with our George Remus, okay. and then uh, Eight and Sand, and then Rossville. Okay. And uh, we wanted to make sure we did the rye right for us. Mm -hmm. um, we have two expressions at one at 94 proof and then one at barrel proof. Uh, I was like to point out this isn't a single barrel, mm -hmm. uh, this is multiple barrels, okay. uh, but just at their barrel proof, okay, no, no water sense. added. Right, right, right. right. And th the other thing we wanted to do was be as transparent as possible. Just and great. we weren't going to use the term that means nothing like small batch or oh, yeah. batch one or batch right. two. So what we do on our Rossville Union line is when we bottle, we put the number of barrels used or dumped oh, awesome. right on the bottle. So Pretty for cool. the nine, for this particular, uh, Rossville Union Mastercrafted at 94. We have right here that we used 859 barrels. That's awesome. And for our, uh, for this barrel proof, there were 83 barrels used Very cool. for that one. So we don't plan on always dumping the same number of sure. barrels, but close to that. Yeah. So if you have a bottle of either one and then you later pick up another bottle and you see that barrel number change, mm -hmm. you know that it was a, a different dumping so very it's cool. maybe a way of saying batches but it's more it actually to me it's more, more relevant about how many barrels did they use it is so, really i don't know anybody else that does that that's we really weren't cool. either so i'm sure there's a few craft guys that may be doing probably. something like that but not uh, that many barrels as, i'm sure probably not but um we certainly wanted uh to put something mean, meaningful on the label in, yeah in this line that's really cool mm -hmm. i've never even it's brilliant. It's good. Idea. I love it. <laughs> Let you guys tell how many barrels are put in there. That's, yeah. that's, that's really This neat. is both of these are uh, a combination of rye whiskey that's five to seven years old. Okay. And there are also multiple rye mash bills in okay. them. So at MGP, we make everything from a 51% rye all the way up to 100% rye. Yeah. Uh, we make a lot of 95% rye that mm -hmm. people know about. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and even in the 51 ranges, your other 49 can be different grains. Well, mm. we do one where it's 51 rye, 45 corn, 4% barley malt. Okay. We do another one that's 59 rye or 51 rye, 49 barley malt. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So you get a lot of that malt kind of nutty characteristics mm. that go well with the rye. Yeah. So then we get to put all those together, and that, for us, made a very flavorful rye. We specifically put this one together to be a very, what I call, approachable rye. Okay. People have had rye, or they've wanted to try mm. rye, maybe not had the best experience with sure. it. means it probably somebody other than MGP made it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, 
but they but their friends like Briar. They've heard sure. about Briar and they want to try it. So this was certainly a very approachable rye. Mm -hmm. There's a little some sweetness to it, but certainly mm -hmm. all that rye character as yeah, well. Definitely. And then uh, the, this barrel proof is also a combination of multiple uh, rye mash bills, okay. but they're not the same oh, because whenever okay. you blend, um, you need to know your final proof. So you blend okay, at sense. that proof, okay. and the blend for this proof um, may taste different at barrel strength and vice versa. Makes sense. So it is not just the same thing at two different proofs. Okay. They're crafted for the proof that they are. Awesome. All right. They're both great. I know that. Especially love that barrel proof. That thing is killer. It is. Especially at fifty nine ninety nine, can't beat the price of yeah. that either. <laughs> it really can't. Yeah, if I didn't mention this particular barrel proof is 112.6. Okay. Uh, the conditions of our warehouses and MGP cause the barrels to absorb water, and so the proofs go down over time. Okay. Our entry proof uh, for all of our products is at 120. Okay. By law, they have to be 125 or less. Okay. And at the Lawrenceburg Distillery, we feel just a little more water in there mm -hmm. helps with um, the extraction of the flavor compounds from okay. the barrel. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Very so cool. that's why, you know, you'll see, of course, barrel proof products over 125. And that means that the warehouse was probably very hot and dry. Okay. And um, more water than alcohol left the barrel. Okay. And that drove the proof up. Makes sense. And very cool. the uh, construction of MGP warehouses, primarily uh, brick with mm -hmm. really thick concrete uh, floors, generally oh, about okay. um, most of our warehouses are six store six stories high okay. six barrels high per floor very cool mm -hmm. and they're very humid and it's a pleasure to walk into one of them because it's almost like you're taking a little drink you're not so, you're not in the sauna sweating to death in them yeah it, it's cool but humid cool but humid <laughs> yeah. okay sweaty and cool yeah there you go very good so this is our uh, our rossville union named after george ross who started the rossville distillery in 1847 on our current distillery campus. So there's been That's distilling awesome. there since uh, 1847. There's actually wow. records that go back to about 1806. Wow. And um, the distillery at, in 1806, uh, in all the history books, talk about how they made a whopping two barrels a week <laughs> and that the grist mill was powered by an unfortunate blind horse. Oh, <laughs> Which is why uh, on our neck tag, we have this little horse. <laughs> yeah. That's more of a little inside joke. That's that, awesome. That we have about I uh, love it. the original uh, distillery there in Lawrenceburg and, and, our, and at our distillery campus there. That's but then cool. several of the uh, smaller distilleries, actually Lawrenceburg, Indiana mm -hmm. became known as Whiskey City. There were so many distilleries okay. there. It was in the grain belt of Southern Indiana, right on the Ohio. Mm -hmm. But one of the main reasons people congregated there to make whiskey is Lawrenceburg sets on this vast aquifer. Ah, and there, not reason. only is it, you know, very pure water that's been filtered through sand and gravel and limestone to mm -hmm. remove, remove iron and sulfur, those things that will sure. foul whiskey all year long. It was a constant 56 degrees. Oh, and when cool. you produce alcohol, you generate a lot of heat that you need to control, sure. especially in fermentation. Mm -hmm. And, in the 1880s or 18, yeah. any time, in, any time in the 1800s, if you had this constant supply of cool water, it was a godsend. For so real, that's right? why there were so many distilleries there. And then George Ross started buying some of them. Mm -hmm. And that's when he changed the name from the Rossville Distillery to the Rossville Union. So they ah, all formed part of cool. the new, bigger distillery that he was uh, amassing there in, in Lawrenceburg. Very cool. And so, that's why we uh, embossed the label or the bottle with uh, 1847 and named okay. this brand after the original distillery. It was one yeah. of the few distilleries that actually produced during Prohibition. They made Ooh, some uh, right medicinal on. alcohol. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So our Rossville Union Rye Whiskey. I'm going to say hi to a few people in the chat because we got a okay. bunch of people. All right. So hope you guys are enjoying your lunchtime uh whiskey talk today i certainly am so we got rob davy donald rance arthur lopez bourbon insane hey chris jeremy kentucky jason coates adhd fishing 
Uh, let's see what else is in here. DJ Beacon. Uh, Captain Make It Happen. Zach Andrews. Mark Goins. Um, still in Canada. Zach Andrews. D.H. Sill. Victoria. Uh, that was Eric Waite. And I think everybody. Spencer Mav. And Steve A. just came in. All right. All right, everybody. So we're going to jump into the main thing we came for, all this cool George Remus. So That's let's right. move on to that. Yeah. Before we get into the repeal, I'll pull up this bottle, which somebody's already had. <laughs> <laughs> Means it's good. That's right. So in our bourbon brand, uh, we named that after George Remus. He's on the label. He's behind us right now. And uh, George Remus was a real person. He immigrated to the United States in the 1880s with his parents. They settled in Chicago and he started working at his uncle's pharmacy there. Mm-hmm. And uh, at age 19, he got his pharmacist's license and uh, started almost running the place. And then <laughs> wow, uh, at age 21, he took over that Dang. pharmacy wow. and he got a little bored doing that and then uh, went to law school and at age 24 became an attorney. Oh and this is gosh. 1900. Wow, he's super smart. Yes, he was a very smart <laughs> man. He loved to study. He loved to read. And uh, he was a defense attorney for a couple of decades, just going uh-huh. along, doing his normal thing. His biggest claim to fame during that time is if he was not the first, he was one of the first attorneys in the United States to attempt to use the insanity defense <laughs> to get one of his clients off the hook. That's it, didn't work, it didn't but, work. But he tried. <laughs> So then 1920, uh, he starts having clients who are bootleggers. Hmm. And he says two things about these guys. He says, they've got tons of money. They get caught and they just pull out wads of cash, pay their fine and leave. And that really intrigued him. (laughs) The other thing he said about them is that they're stupid. And so (laughs) he decided he could make prohibition work for him. So he studied the Volstead Act. The Volstead Act is what gave us prohibition. And uh, there was a few loopholes in there. And one of the biggest loopholes is that you could sell medicinal alcohol during prohibition. And we often think about prohibition where all the liquor in this country was put down the drain. And Mm -hmm. that's not what happened. You know, whatever you owned was your personal property and you couldn't couldn't be taken from you. You couldn't sell it, but it was your right to drink it in your own home. But there was all this whiskey in the whiskey warehouses sure. in Kentucky and at our distillery mm-hmm. in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Okay. So George Remus moved from Chicago to Cincinnati to be close to all those shuttered whiskey warehouses. Ah, he obtained government permits to withdraw that whiskey for uh, medicinal purposes. Okay. And he started doing that. And that lasted a couple of months. And he decided he could make a lot more money bootlegging. <laughs> so... He right, knew when works. his own men were going to come to the distillery and pull barrels. Yeah. So he would let them load up the barrels and then some of his other men would come hijack those guys. I think they'd stage a little fight and then they'd drive off and then he would just claim he got robbed. He got robbed and then that would be taken wow. to this operation he had set up on a farm outside of Cincinnati. Okay. And this farm had a long, windy driveway mm-hmm. and it, the farm became known as Death Valley Farm because he had snipers positioned around this farm. Holy crap. And uh, if you didn't know the signal to flash your lights just right as you came down the driveway, uh, your tires or maybe yourself would be taken out. So, oh, right. Yeah. So he starts uh, really moving a lot of alcohol. And again, mm-hmm. when we think about prohibition, we think of the alcohol that was available. It was mm-hmm. like moonshine, rock right. guy, awful stuff. Sure. Well, he had aged whiskey. Mm. Some of this aged whiskey was from pre-World War One. Wow. And, uh, wow. Several years nice. ago, there was an HBO special called Boardwalk Empire. Mm-hmm. And in the second season of that, okay. George Remus was a character. Oh, and, awesome. the, and the people in the uh, in the show talked about needing to go to George to get the good whiskey, <laughs> to get gorgeous. the good alcohol. And that's exactly what he provided people. Okay. And it's estimated that at one time he controlled about 35% of the bootlegged alcohol wow, that's uh, in the early part of Prohibition. And he, like those bootleggers he used to defend, started making a lot of money. 
I would imagine. And he kind of went to his head. So <laughs> he he started referring to himself in the third person. And so it was always George Remus says, you know, George Remus says, this is good. You know, George Remus yeah. says, you should buy my stuff, whatever. And uh, he wanted to show it off his wealth. Okay. So he bought a big mansion in Cincinnati okay. and he started throwing these huge parties. And at one of his parties, he gave every man in attendance a diamond stick pin. And That's the true. servants brought them out, a little box, and all the men got one and they put it on. And all the women were like, what do we get? Some more servants came out. They all got a little box. They opened the box and it was a set of keys. Nice. And they went outside and lined up in the driveway and down the street. Every woman got a brand new Pontiac. <laughs> That must be, that must have been a sight to see yeah. what a bunch of Pontiacs yeah. lines So I coined the first Oprah. You know, first. you all, you got a car, you got a car. Yeah, really? Yeah, so, <laughs> so a lot of people wanted to meet this guy. You I know, would imagine. rub elbows with this guy. Yeah, for And real. as legend has it, um, one of the people that was an acquaintance of George Remus was F. Scott Fitzgerald. Oh, awesome. And so the legend is, is that George Remus was the inspiration for Gatsby. That's very the great cool. Gatsby. And because of that, that's why our Remus Repeal Reserve doesn't look like your typical bourbon bottle, but has this Art Deco look, uh, kind of Roaring Twenties look to it, as that nod to uh, George Remus and his connection to the great Gatsby. That's very cool. That's beautiful. So this series two is what we're going to try. And I'll mm -hmm. talk about the series and how this changes each year. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Sounds right. good. So I want to drink some whiskey. All right. All right. Let you do the honors. Thank you. So this George Remus bourbon is five to seven years old. And uh, it's a combination of high rye okay. mash bills. Okay. And it's at 94 proof. Okay. The repeal is also a combination of high rye mash bills. And on this one, we're, we're putting the mash bills together to achieve a profile okay. that will be consistent every time that we buy. Okay, makes sense. For the repeal, the okay. mash bills change every year oh, the percentage of those mash bills change every year Ooh, and we okay. want people to know exactly what they are Perfect. so we put that right on the bottle very cool so with this one uh there is some um, 2007 2008 uh bourbon in there and then we tell whether it's a 21 percent rye or a 36 percent rye okay. and then how much of each one of those is in this by percent Awesome. And this is a way so that everyone knows exactly what's in it. Mm -hmm. And at 100 proof, uh, it differentiates itself from uh, the George Remus at, at 94. Okay. When we first did this, Series 1, um, which you'll never see in Texas, <laughs> okay, somebody yeah, brought right. it in some, some, someplace else, uh, that came out in 2017. Okay. It was at 94 proof. Oh, okay. And while people liked it, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the only criticism criticism was, well, it shows a little higher proof. Okay. My thought is anybody can do proof. Sure. The proof just has to be right. Agreed. And we we tried different combinations yeah. for series two and found that we could have a very very flavorful bourbon at a hundred proof with okay. what we were doing. And so uh, series two is a hundred proof. Later we're going to get to series three. It's also awesome. hundred proof. So enough of that. Let's try it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I love the fact you guys tell everybody what's in it. That's it's I wish all distillers would do that. <sighs> Lots of vanilla, and oak and caramel, mm -hmm. some baking spices, mm -hmm. some mint. My distinct uh fruit in series two is cherry yeah like a black cherry mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and everything else you mentioned right yeah <laughs> <laughs> it smells like good bourbon that's the way it's supposed to smell mm -hmm. mm. 
Mm. That's definitely the right way to start the day. Mm -hmm. Really good bourbon. Mm -hmm. Mm. So one of the ways that uh, master blenders at NGP get to have fun is just take all of our good stuff and start putting it together. Yeah, it sounds like a terrible job. I know. It's <laughs> uh, dragged me to work, I know. <laughs> and um, the other night, uh, we did a, with you, we did a little class yeah, in, our, in our rye um, products where we would take uh, a 51% rye and a 95% rye mm -hmm. as far as mash bills. Right. And you got the opportunity to mix those together to mm -hmm. your liking. That was really fun. Um, it would be the similar process with the bourbons. Okay. okay. So we would have some of the 21% rye. And mm -hmm. when I say 21% rye, so it's 75% corn, Okay. 21% rye, 4% barley malt. Okay. So that makes 100. Makes sense. And on our 36% rye, that's 60% corn, 36% rye, 4% barley malt, okay. also 100. And we've had people buy those and they'll bottle one of those as sure. their brand. Right. And another way to be a little different for us was mm -hmm. to actually put those together. Okay. Excellent. And that's what this George Remus is. And so is this. Okay. Again, we're achieving a profile with this one, and this one changes every year yeah, which on, is really on cool. purpose. Right. So I keep talking about Series 2. There's a little Roman numeral 2 mm -hmm. right here, and on um, the label, which might be really hard for people to see unless you yeah. read it, uh, it says the 2018 medley and then shows that. I don't know if there's a way to get that yeah, close enough. Yeah, I can put it close and see if anybody can. People can see that. Let's see if it'll focus. Yep, there we go. Okay. So that's very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, of course, I won't put anything in a bottle that doesn't have a very smooth finish. Um, it's, it's fine that things warm you, but they're never sure. going to burn you. I mean, no, it's that a even very... goes back to the, our vodka. You know, we're yeah, not I agree put on that. That's true. Out that people are going to have a burn with. Right. If you want to burn, there's plenty of other stuff to go by. <laughs> For sure. So, <laughs> so with this one, um, but there's quite a bit of the higher rye mm. bourbon in this. And so um, that rye lingers mm, definitely. and kind of almost excites the back of the tongue. Totally agree. And people that aren't used to rye, mm -hmm. um, that might catch them off guard just a little bit. Sure. Uh, but then they sip it and then they're, they understand what a high rye bourbon is supposed to be. Definitely mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. I think it's really good. I like a high rye bourbon in general. So mm -hmm. for me, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I got no complaint. Like I said, it's, it's amazingly smooth for being at a hundred proof, but there's no burn. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the perfect sipping bourbon. Um, there's a little bit of faint, faint chocolate that you can get, um, but I think we're going to talk and experience that a little more uh, with Series 3. Oh, okay. Awesome. And so I'll back up. Each year uh, around George Remus's birthday, which is November 14th, okay. uh, we release this. Oh, that's very And cool. the idea is that uh, people will try it or certainly hear about it yeah and we again we released this one in uh 2018 okay but we knew we were coming to texas ah and we've been in texas since may mm -hmm. and we held some back so that when we came to texas uh series two would be available we appreciate that and that will good <laughs> and then uh uh you'll have the opportunity here almost in a week uh, to get series three and awesome. view, and on purpose, they're going to be different. Very cool. But I should shut up about that and we should just try it. There you go. Instead I like of that listening to me about that. So there's very little left <laughs> in this one that we've been sampling, but well, let's it do means that. It, it means it's good. That's what yeah. matters. Mm -hmm. This is also at 100 proof. 
Okay. Yeah, there's a guy in the chat, Benjamin Ease. He wants to know, you guys have any plans to come to South Carolina at all? Someday. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so here I'll talk about that real quick with MGP and its and its brand strategy is our our position is to go what we call narrow and deep. Okay. The idea is not okay, we're going to launch these brands in all 50 states mm -hmm. and then uh, potentially fail in some of them. Yes. Okay. So we wanted to be strong in the markets that we were in. Okay. We started close to home. So, so our much. corporate headquarters is in uh, Kansas and we have a distillery in Kansas. We have our Lawrenceburg, Indiana uh, distillery. So of course we started in Indiana, Ohio, Makes Kentucky, yeah. Missouri, uh, okay. Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, then we went into Minnesota, okay. and then like we, we actually surrounded Illinois before we went into Illinois, because you have to make sure you do Chicago right. Sure, And, and Chicago is different than downstate Illinois, and so sure. you really have to understand all of that. And we knew we wanted to come to Texas, but you got to do Texas right. How right. do you want to do, you know, if you're going to go to Dallas, then you got to be strong in Houston, you got to have presence in Austin, and so sure. all the places. Yeah. And um, as everybody knows, it's a big state. Yes, and it is. So, <laughs> and so we wanted to do it right. And we've, we've only been in the state since May, okay. but um, great reception. Awesome. And uh, for folks like you uh, spreading the word, we appreciate yeah, we it. So. Yeah. <laughs> good product makes makes good whiskey and yeah. makes people want to drink it. Mm -hmm. So more than right. happy. So Series 3, also at 100 proof, but this has a lot more of the 21% rye bourbon in okay. it compared to this one. Oh yeah, so like you said, that chocolatey note really mm -hmm. pops on this mm -hmm. one. I don't know if you'll be able to get that close. Sure. Or maybe even do them side by side so people see, but they're, <clears throat> it's the see. idea of this one. Let me do this, get them both on screen. Back a little bit. Hopefully you guys can read that so you can see the differences in them. Now I got some info here we can okay. post somehow. So to do that. Oh yeah, we can definitely post that. That's and easy. then I'll I'll be quiet as you try it and experience the finish, and then after you you talk, I'll talk about it. The smell on this one is um, a little more oaky, but more oily as well on this on the nose on this one, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's see how it tastes. Like white chocolate on the finish. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ooh, that's really good. Still, like a week or two, this will be out. Mm -hmm. Ooh, definitely I get, of all of that. I get, and some other people have mm. gotten on the finish a little bit of orange, candied orange. I like those. Yeah, those oranges like Christmas time and you crush mm -hmm. them. Yeah, that's definitely in mm -hmm. there. Which is a little surprising um, mm. for some folks. Um, it actually kind of surprised me. Okay. When, we, when we put this one together and as we tried it and it, it's great when you when you have something mm -hmm. and there's something pleasantly unexpected absolutely and as that comes through um we got a couple people even questioned did you sure you didn't like put this in some kind of secondary barrel where it's pulling something out it's like nope did not do that <laughs> no yeah it, and i found that on some other bourbons too yeah that's really predominant, though. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like this, I mean, in a real generic mm -hmm. term, Series 3 is going to be a little sweeter than yeah, Series 2. Yeah, I would agree. You don't have that rye spice on this as, one. Because it's predominantly the 21% rye. Okay. Um, but they're supposed to be different. Right. That's, that's the goal of these series is yeah. that, uh, oh, I like Series 2. I'm interested to try what Series 3. And Absolutely. people are going to have a personal favorite. Oh, sure. Um, but they st will still like them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you hey. just have a favorite. Yeah, exactly. It's like a kid. For so. me, you know, it's going to be a mood thing. It's like, do you want a spicier bourbon? Then mm -hmm. you go with the two. Right. Do you want a sweeter one? This is perfect. This is mm -hmm. like the perfect one to share at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. The three, especially mm -hmm. coming out near Christmas, to be exactly. perfect. So. Well, 
we're very thankful that George's birthday was close. Yeah, really, Christmas. right? <laughs> <laughs> launch, in, launch these in uh, November just in time for the holidays. So. Definitely. Oh, two things I didn't, or one thing I didn't point out about the bottle is because uh, George Remus was a pharmacist and an attorney, mm -hmm. uh, we have records with his signature. Really? And so cool. on the cork, you will see oh, that's cool. his signature. I think you can maybe put yeah, that up to the screen where yeah, people can see very it. very cool. And then yes, at the uh, base of the bottle, we'll wait till you're done with that. That's really cool. That's cool. At the base of the bottle, uh, his name is also huh. uh, embossed. So as you look at Very it, you cool. kind of hold it down in there. You can see it at the base awesome. of the bottle. That's cool. We'll start way at the bottom of that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's coming through. There we go. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Man, that's some intricate detail on the bottle. So it's just a nice bottle. It's not. It's nice and heavy too. Mm -hmm. It's not weak. It's, I like that it's a different design. It's just. Yeah. It stands out on the shelf. Yeah. Again, it's on purpose not to look like your typical bourbon bottle uh, to really showcase that connection with uh, George Remus and the great Gatsby. Mm. Uh, and then on the back, uh, there'll be, uh, of course, George Remus and a little more um, about this particular uh, reserve. Okay. A little bit of our tasting notes on there. Very cool. And then to commemorate the year that it comes out. So we certainly hope to continue this, and I hope so. It's really good. Get up to the high Roman numeral someday. And yeah, for real, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's, so every it'll be an annual release every annual year, right? release. Okay. Um, it's a limited release. Okay. But we don't believe in so limited you can't find it. Yeah, it's just or, like a crazy allocated. There's, no. there's a bunch of it, so you can get one. Everybody can get one. Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. It makes everyone right. happy. But when they're gone, they're gone. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, like I said, it's it's one time so release. Sure. And, uh, Certain states just based on size get a little more than the others, sure. or how it's distributed, even through this. Right. But I know you know some people that Definitely. already are bringing it in and absolutely are going to get it, so that's great. Then the next thing that we are launching that is within the Remus line, and okay. I'm sorry, I do not have a sample to share. Okay. Is our Remus Volstead. Reserve, and I will just show you this little card about it. Oh, very cool! This is a 14-year-old bottled and bond bourbon. Okay. And next year is the 2020 is the hundredth anniversary of the start of prohibition. Oh yeah. Oh, that's true. And so it? to commemorate that, even though George Remus, uh, I guess in the way he did need prohibition. Yeah, really. That's what took off um, <laughs> to commemorate that anniversary? We are releasing this 14-year-old. Uh, bottled and bond bourbon. All the bourbon was made in the fall season of 2005. Okay. So that made it 14 years old this fall. Very nice. And uh, we had to wait just till a couple of weeks ago to dump all the barrels oh, okay. so that they Makes were sense. all 14 years old. Right. And uh, dressed up the bottle a little bit as this. It looks like uh, a sexy bottle. Commemorative. Again, that Art Deco look and feel of the 20s cool. to commemorate that. And this will be available. Um, it should be in the store sometime in December. Okay. Very Moving cool. into uh, 2020. Okay. Awesome. Honor that. Yeah. Hopefully, hopes to get a bottle of that. It looks really good. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And this, uh, this is um, sweet as well. Okay. Yeah, it's a sweeter it's, one. Okay. It's uh, the 21% rye. Okay. Uh, and so, kind of as you just experienced with Series 3 mm -hmm. compared to Series 2. Uh, a little sweeter. Okay. Uh, I would say this one's even sweeter. Even sweeter. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should be nice for a 14 year. That'll be really yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. We'll make sure everyone's aware of that. And you will, it'll actually be in a box. Oh, okay. So it's one of the, it's a good box. It kind of opens up like a clamshell. So oh, on nice. the, cool. on the shelf, uh, you'll see the box and then I'm sure some places will have them open. So you sure. can see the little bottle in the box. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's yeah. like the whole Roaring Twenties concept yeah. with the box, even that's really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, okay, that's awesome. So, do we have any questions? Or are we we caught up? Let's see here. 
All right, if anybody has questions in the chat, let us know. See if I can find any that we need to answer, or if it's just them chatting. But <laughs> I guess people were talking about if it's if it's in if it's in Indiana, it's MGP. The people, you know, wishing they put on the label. Well, yeah, it's pretty obvious, guys. If that says Lawrenceburg, you know where it was made. It's not that difficult. So, how far away is your Kansas distillery to your uh, Indiana distillery? How mileage wise is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know, think about. Oh, I can tell you. It's that, several, I mean, it's we have to go through Missouri, and okay, Illinois, and then across Indiana. Okay, because I didn't even realize there was one there in Kansas before today. So that's yeah, that's really cool. Mm. I I go back and forth, but I always fly, so I've never thought oh. about how far it is. <laughs> I've, I've never driven it, so it's probably a plus in your life. <laughs> yeah, far far okay. enough to drive. So I would assume I don't know six, seven, eight hours, something like that, my guess. But I really have no idea. One question I'm not prepared for. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, so Scott from my German bourbon journey came in. All right. Lots of other cool YouTubers in here today. See, so Brennan Elliott, how's it going? You got YLW in here. How's it going? Let's see who else came in here. Three weeks. 621 miles. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So it's a ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not close. Okay. So, Lawrenceburg is southeast Indiana. Okay. Right on the Ohio River in the tri state area. Okay. And it's really confusing when people fly there because the, the Cincinnati Airport mm -hmm. is in northern Kentucky. Yeah. So, it's the Cincinnati, oh. it's the okay. Greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky Airport. And okay. so many times I've been on the plane and we land and People go, oh, I've never been to uh, Ohio before. And I say, well, you still haven't been. And they're like, what? I'm supposed to be in Cincinnati. I said, you will be, but we're in Kentucky right now. I did not know that. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Okay. So Cincinnati uh, is about 20 minutes to Lawrenceburg. And as I talked about, uh, George Remus buying up or uh, getting permits to pull barrels mm -hmm. out of certain warehouses. Uh, there were warehouses in Lawrenceburg that uh -huh. he pulled uh, alcohol out of. He actually put his brother-in-law in charge of distillery there. Mm. And it was actually barrels and bottles from Lawrenceburg that got that got George Remus caught. <laughs> and uh, there was a, a guy on his honeymoon from Chicago that was, he was from Chicago, was honeymooning in the Cincinnati area. And he was approached to take some whiskey back with him mm. for a few dollars and uh, he through a traffic stop he got uh. in, the car was inspected and they saw the whiskey in it and he didn't want to go to jail so he told where he got it and talked yeah. about death valley farm then there was a raid at death valley farm uh -huh. and they had these barrels and these bottles that had Orangeburg, indiana on it and then they did a raid there oh, and with geez. that evidence is what got george remus in jail. Ah. Mm -hmm. So there was some real strong ties with George Remus and our distillery. And that's why we wanted to, you know, have fun with that, yeah. that whole time period, but also the connection with sure. him and the distillery. That's very it's not cool. just a name that we pulled out of a hat. Uh, right, you know, right. So. Makes sense. <laughs> Someone wants to know, do you guys H of Justin or are you in Kansas as well? Do you, or does it take So in Kansas, it's all what we call white goods. So okay. it's vodka, and gin. Ah, we don't okay. make any whiskey. No whiskey. Okay. Or in in okay. Yeah. All, all right. the whiskey, bur all the bourbons, rye whiskeys, corn whiskeys, light whiskeys. All, that's all done in Lawrenceburg. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So Donald wants to know, you guys ever going to go into Canada by chance? <laughs> Maybe someday, a Maybe long time someday, from now. <laughs> yeah. Right now we're in 20, Just, 20 states, you know, yeah, <laughs> we'll that's get, almost we'll, half. So yeah, that's pretty good. We're, we're, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know anybody in uh, Minnesota? <laughs> we're that far north. <laughs> there, Donald. Uh, unfortunately, you have to go to Minnesota. So you have to cross the border or get someone to bring it to you from Minnesota. Yeah. Well, one of the two you of your options. Any of that, so you figure that out. Yeah, that, that, that's not our problem. That, that's your own problem, how that works. I don't know. I guess declare it at customs or whatever you got to do when you cross the border. Wow. Yeah, and like I said, Eric, yeah, more transfers for everyone. Exactly. And there's transparent as you can be. So 
and you put everything on the front of the bottle, you really can't complain. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. I wish everybody else would do that, but mm -hmm. this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Remus is, oh yeah, so I guess, you know, he got in trouble. So did he, how long did he spend in prison for, any idea? Uh, or did he finish life you in know, prison? No, no, he eventually got out, out of jail. It's, um, it's an interesting story. There's a book out right now. It's on the New York Times bestseller list called The Ghost of Eden Park. Okay. And it talks about George Remus. And there's other books, uh, George Remus, King of the Bootleggers. That's what he called himself. He called himself awesome. King of the Bootleggers, wow. which is why we have that right here. Oh, that's on, very cool. On the label, King of the Bootleggers. And um, he, it was, it's interesting about the time that he was in prison that it almost seemed like a country club. Oh, okay. Uh, because there was a lot of bribery. Sure. And you could pay guards. Uh, yeah. There's pictures of him in prison wearing his three piece suit and eating a steak. Oh and sometimes his wife wow. came in and cleaned the cell and prepared meals. And what we would do is you would also invite some of the other inmates and then you, you know, grease the palm of, of the guards sure. and the wardens. And the Rima story and everything even go, goes all the way to the president in terms of. Really? How permits were obtained, whose wow. palms were greased, so you could do that. Yeah. And there were a lot of people that were supposed to enforce prohibition, yeah. but they made a lot of money off of that. Too. Sure. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smart man, pay the right people, yeah. you'll be fine. And then the other little interesting thing about George Remus is he didn't drink. So he would throw these big parties. He'd, la he'd give everybody their gifts. Oh my God. He would make sure they're having a great time. Yeah. And then he might retire to his study and just read a book. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great time at my house. I'll see you guys later. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, I can imagine the cleanup after these parties must have been insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, he didn't carry plenty of service to take care of that. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, I guess, Jason, there's actually, I guess, a Ken Burns. Prohibition explains Remus' whole story is amazing. So I guess yeah. I'll so tell you about that. Uh, I believe that was a PBS special okay. that Ken Burns did, um, and he does little highlights on okay. the prominent people during okay. Prohibition. That makes sense. And George Remus was really early in Prohibition. Okay, and that's why some of his story got lost compared to people like Capone and sure. people that came later, yeah. or certainly had more of. No, kind of the gangster part to yeah. it. That so he wasn't as movies. nowhere near as violent as like Capone and those guys. Just I guess if you came to the farm, not so great Just, for you. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, there w George Remus eventually does uh, kill his wife. There's a awesome. there's a whole issue with that that while he was in prison, uh, an FBI agent was he thought he was working with this FBI agent to yeah. turn evidence on other people and other okay. people in the government. Yeah. But while he was doing that, this FBI agent was having an affair with George Remus's wife. George Lovely. Remus had, had, uh, had turned, had put a lot of things in her name so she could still run the business while he was in jail. Uh, okay. When he got out of prison, he came home and there was three suits hanging in the mansion and she'd taken everything. Holy yeah. crap. So in a fit of rage, he uh, saw her and, and shot her. Wow. Went to jet, went to trial. And uh, he defended himself. Yeah. Used the insanity defense and got off. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's <laughs> crazy. And uh, that book that I mentioned is mostly about that trial. Okay, mm -hmm. very uh, interesting. He, it happened in Eden Park, and so that's why it's called. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and then, and then he spent most of his time really trying to get money out of people that had. He felt had cheated him. Sure. And that's how he spent most of his life. And uh, he died sometime in the 1950s. I can't remember. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we got. Hang on. Well, Donald, some, Jason says he'll meet you in somewhere near the border. So you guys worked out amongst <laughs> yeah, yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. You have a fun time with that. You need a modern movie? I'm sure they'll make one. I wouldn't be surprised after it, this it, stuff. Ooh, it, Great. Yeah, we would love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. You know, they have, don't have a lot of new ideas. It seems like yeah. really anyway. Mm -hmm. Might as well make a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that'd be cool. Um, that's awesome. His wife cleaned out his cell and served him dinner in jail and he killed her. Well, if you took all your crap, 
Yeah, that's why I blame him. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of hard. Well, it. I'm actually going through this book right now, and it's interesting to see how was she was she loyal or was she playing it? I don't know. You know that's a valid point mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Was there anything else you want to discuss? I think we've covered it all. That's quite a bit. Thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. To, so listen fantastic. to everything about our brands at MGP. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. I really sure. appreciate it. Hope if there's any of the questions, um, let us know. Otherwise, we're going to sign off because this was fantastic and mm-hmm. learned a lot of cool stuff and right. try some great whiskey. So, right. well, give you guys about 15 seconds or so. If not, then we'll cut it off. So, let's see here. It says, out of the end, which one, what, Rye Source and GP, which. Which ride is you like? I guess that's the question. So which ride do you like? Do you like the 95 or the 20? Which match do you like better personally for yourself that you guys make as far as for like the going to these? Do you like the high ride or the low ride? I know that's relative. If you're 35 and 21 or 36 and 21. Or does it just well, matter I, what you're I li- making? I like them in combination. Okay. You like it better uh, as a blend it, together. Exactly. With the rise and the bourbons. Okay. So – the job of a master blender is one plus one must equal three, four, or five. Right, right. And it's really so that you have some, when you put two things together, that they're greater than the sum of their parts. Yeah. And yeah, so sure. if it's higher corn, you get sweetness. If it's higher rye, you get that spice mm-hmm. and you put them together, um, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Sure. The same way with the rye. If okay. you just use 100% rye or even a 95% yeah. rye, that's a lot of rye. But yes, if you also put some rye whiskey in there that has more barley malt mm-hmm. or more corn, then you can kind of change the characteristic. Okay. Just like when you did that blending exercise. That was really cool. I don't you could have, you could have labeled cool. both of those, the 51% yeah. rye and the 95% rye on the shelf for both the rye That's whiskey. True. But That's they true. have a significantly different flavor profile. Oh, yeah. It was vastly, it was vastly different mm-hmm. how big it was. Yeah. But yeah, when we blended them together, I really liked a higher of the 95 and mm-hmm. with the sweeter, but it balanced out really nice. Mm-hmm. But right, I think that was my favorite. Was mm-hmm. Which I'd never been to a tasting that actually let you do that, which was a really cool thing to do the tasting. It's like, here, blend it yourself. I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I had fun with that. That was a lot so of fun. So, to answer that question, um, I will. I would prefer them together. Okay. And that's why all these brands are. You know, that's what this is. That's what sure. this is. Um, the only one that's really not, uh, as far as multiple mash bills, mm. is going to be the Bolstead. Okay. And a little bit of that is because... When you do bottled and bond, mm-hmm. everything has uh, to be made within the same six months. Right. And um, it really seemed the best profile mm. to use multiple batches of the 21% rye. Okay. So it still carries that idea about blending sure. those batches together. They're just all the same mash bill. Uh, okay. All that kind of some made in July all the way into yeah. uh, October of 2005. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that was a lot of fun to do it that way too. Yeah, I'd mm-hmm. imagine. So, <laughs> but it, but it constrains you because it's like right because you here's got what that we have from period. this six sure. months. Mm-hmm. So do you sit at home a lot of times, just mix the stuff together you guys make and just see what you come up with, or just mostly do that at work. It depends. It depends because sometimes, well, sometimes it's fun to bring your home your work home with you. But, For real. <laughs> but if if you do it at home, then you're home. Well, that's you true. Know? That's <laughs> true. That's a valid point. I don't have to worry about how am I getting home. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you do as much as you want and just roll into bed. <laughs> Problem solved. Uh, this is how can you try to... Oh, they, someone's know. Can you visit the distillery? Is that they not? They don't have tours. No, or we don't have tours. No tours. We're, we're we're thinking about how to have some type of a home place and some okay. type of visitor center. But right now, it's problematic because we make alcohol for so many people oh sure they want to roll up and go oh so this is where yeah why is it's made it's all like, the contracts are can't talk sure. about that right, right and it's a, it's a working distillery it's not set up for a disney tour and we right. have like these separate little things built for show yeah uh, we're thinking about you know what can we do like a visitor uh, center or something yeah. kind of concept but still thing. as a as a brands company right yeah you can't sh- <laughs> right so. right yeah that's true too yeah because you can't be showing them stuff that's other people's brands for obvious reasons that's right mm-hmm. so yeah that's very cool but we get asked that a lot and unfortunately no mm-hmm. you can drive by it there <laughs> you go it. see guys you can drive by it take a picture from the outside you'll be great you know it'll be cool i don't know because it's a huge camp it's a huge camp mm-hmm. yeah because i know yeah. because it's the what the old seagram's factory. yeah so after uh rossville the Rossville Union Distillery lasted all the way through Prohibition. And okay. then after Prohibition, 
Seagram's purchased it. Ah, okay. And uh, then Seagram's built through the 30s a lot of the big brick warehouses that we use okay. to age okay. in now. Uh, and that's why when you go by, it says Seagram's 1857, because that was the founding year of Seagram's. Uh, but for Rossville and the distillery there, it was actually 1847. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, but that was their their buildings, sure. and so they put their name right. and year on it. So makes sense. Mm -hmm. Ten years off. <laughs> that works. Now, did you guys add new buildings, or is it all pretty much been the Seagram's, and that's what's been there? That's what you guys. Oh, we've years. made a, several several more. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's old distillery. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to at that mm -hmm. point. That's mm -hmm. very cool. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Yes. Okay. What is the MG? My truck first. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's what you should probably not put it in your truck, Eric. I'm thinking whiskey in the truck. It'll probably run for a little bit. Probably not good for the truck. <laughs> I guess that's ethanol, but Ooh. sure, why not? I, I prefer probably not to drink ethanol, so thinking that would end poorly. Yeah. Good trip to the hospital or death. Mm -hmm. So just stick with whiskey and don't put it in your truck. Okay. All right, guys, I really appreciate it. Hope this made you guys lunch better today. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks for joining us, and we'll see you guys next time. Cheers, David. Cheers. Thanks for appreciating it. Yep. Cheers. Cheers. All right. And...